Very humid. Crazy. All right. Almost ready. Hi, Mike. I see you just joined. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, I think the stream is working. I, I believe it is. Yeah, looks like it's on. Excellent. Julie. All right, and the sound is working. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi. Okay, well, welcome to Human Design Catalyst number 56, Channels by Type and uh, the Creative Channels. So what I've what I've done for this, yeah, I do like your your sauna, Eric. It's great. Um, uh oh, here we go. Okay, so all I've really done is um, I've been reading through the channels by type materials, and I figured for this this time, hey Jenny, I figured for this time around we could just uh, look at channels that we have, like people who want to hear what Ra has to say about those channels. I will I will read his entries for those channels. And um, also we can just discuss them. Like if we all have, if we have personal. Hi, Barbara, welcome, welcome. So um, yeah, so I was, I was starting, I was looking at the seven creative channels and maybe I'll just start going through them and we'll see who has them. Um, and if we wanna talk about them. So does anyone here have the eight one? Or the one eight, as it were. The one eight. Yeah. It feels like I can't throw a rock without hitting a one eight in, in real life, and yet nobody on here with it. It's so interesting. Uh, okay, no. we, can keep, we can keep going with it. That's just one that uh, I, I end up doing a lot of readings for one eight self projected projectors. For some reason, I've got, like, if you look on my YouTube channel, there's like eight readings for them in a row. I don't know why, but I just keep getting one eights. Okay, how about the 5125? Any 5125s out there? Do you have that one, Barbara? Wait. Oh, I have that one. Barbara, Barbara's muted. You're muted. I think oh, Barbara right. has to mute. You have that one, right, John? Don't you have that one? I have that one, yeah. Okay, oh, yes, John has that one. Okay, yeah. well, let's, let's read about that one. Let's see. Thank you, Esther. That'll be a fun one to start with. Yeah, that one I always I always like it. Uh, it's kind of I liken it to um, a pioneer, someone who you know it's it's like Lewis and Clark or something. You know, they're going pioneering or they're or you know going and exploring or the people who went to the moon, but then uh, you know if somebody else went there first, they aren't interested. You know, <laughs> if someone else already discovered it. Good, good thing Lewis and Clark didn't know about the indigenous peoples there, or they would have been like, oh, never mind. Oh, and then as Mike points out, this is Bernie Sanders' only channel. Yeah, really? Okay. He's a 5125 projector. So, okay, just a second. I'm going to read what, what we have here. That. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I never really hear about that as a creative channel, so I'm curious because this is in the Channels by Type uh, Part 1, Introduction and Creative Channels, and this is by Ra um, in around 1999. So this is actually relatively early in the human design literature. I mean, not entirely. There were a lot of lectures done in the early, mid-90s, but it's still somewhat early compared to a lot of the stuff that Oh, shit. Channel of Initiation, page 88. So one second here. And that's an individual channel, of course. And, um, yeah, so it's because I, I just like looking at the channels through these different lenses because I don't normally think of it in terms of creativity. You know, I think about it as competition, as, you know, initiation, as doing something first or being first. And also it's a projector channel. It's, you know, uh, projected. So it's interesting to think about what does it mean to invite that, to invite that person to, you know, initiate you, for instance, uh, into something and being recognized for that. 
So, okay. Here we are. Page 86, 88. So it's part of the centering circuit. Um, the centering circuit is actually only two, two channels. It's the 3410 and the 2551. So the um, centering circuit's a very small circuit. Um, 2410. So here's what Ra has to say about it. Minor circuits have enormous power, and the real power of this circuit is in the 1034, because at that level it's generative, and so it is an energy channel. And we'll look at that when we get to the generating channels. But the creative aspect of this minor circuit is the 5125, the channel of initiation, a design of needing to be first. People often confuse the design of needing to be first, which seems to be highly competitive, with individuals not here to be the best. And it seems to be something that they see as a conflict in terms. It isn't at all. The 5125 can try to be the fastest, but it doesn't mean they're going to have the best running style. So the point Ra is making here is that because it's individual circuitry, it is like kryptonite to the individual or any individual channel to compare itself to others. It really is not here to compare, to say, well, is it the best or the worst, or you know, to rank compared to other people. And this isn't about being the best. It's really just about being the first or the fastest. The fact that they want to compete doesn't mean that that's about being the best. It's just about a drive to compete because they are about initiating things. They're about beginning things. And of course, herein lies the joke. The 5125, the channel of initiation, is a projected element. That has to be a joke. That this channel of initiation, this mystical channel of initiation, has to be recognized I mean, it is yeah. kind of funny, right? It's like it doesn't have, the, there's no motor going to the throat. It can't just, you know, break the flow. I call the, uh, you know, manifestor channels flow breakers because they can interrupt whatever anyone's doing, get their attention, you know, and suddenly they're doing something new, right? But this one, yeah. can't. it has to be recognized, has to be invited, all this stuff. It's a projected element. As a matter of fact, all three mystical channels are, they're all projected. I wonder what he's referring to as the other mystical channels. Um, I mean, I know the mystical stream, which also includes the 1020 and the 3740. Oh, yeah, and from the root. Yeah, they're all projected. The whole mystical stream is projected. That's interesting. There's no energy behind the mystical stream. You know, we, we should do a whole class on the, the mystical stream because it's absolutely fascinating. Basically, it starts... Um, in the root, and it, it's, I think it's the channel you have, Michael, it's the, um, what is that, the, the, 19, the 1949, it starts with the 1949, then it goes to the 3740, then it goes to the 5125, and it ends with the 1020, and so all, so that little, it goes from the root, through the solar plexus, through the ego, the G center, and up out the throat. And basically what Ra said was at a certain point in his studies, he looked at the body graphs for every mystic he could find. He claims it was around 200. Now he had gate 26, that could have been an, an exaggeration, but um, he claims to have looked at the body graphs of around 200 mystics throughout history, at least those that he could find their birthdays, you know, relatively good birth times for, um, th you know, members of the Theosophical Society and all of these things. And he claims that they all had activations in this circuit group or this, mm -hmm. this, this group of channels. And furthermore, that the kind of mystic they were was expressed through that channel. So I guess what I'm saying is, John, you have a mystical channel and the kind of mystic you would be would be the high priestess or high priest or shaman who you know initiates people into the mysteries. You'd be standing there at the end of the tribal <laughs> process saying, okay, you can learn about this stuff, but you got to leave the tribe, the tribe behind, you know, and you have to start this inner journey now because that's basically the phase of the mystical stream. If you look at the mystical stream, it starts tribal with the 1949. It continues tribal with the 3740, and then it leaves behind the tribe as it leaves the ego to go to the G center. And this is about really being, you know, initiated into the, the psychedelic experience or the shamanic experience, the vision quest, all of this stuff. Um, Jonah? Yes. Jonah, is this sort of like the mutation that happens? The mutation? Like for yeah, like- Or for what, for who? 
Yeah, for John, for with the channel when it moves from the more you know kind of tribal to the more individual through the integrate, which is which is highly individual. Is that what what is mutative about it, or? Absolutely. I mean, all individual circuitry is, is mutative and I'll see why Ra calls it creative in a moment because that I actually don't have the answer for, you know, part, oh. part of part of my interest in reading about these is that, um, you know, I'm curious, I, I guess, I think what it is is that Ra identifies these different streams and each one has a creative part to it, which I think typically has to do with what, where it gets to the throat. But in this case, um, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but maybe for the centering circuit, he's saying that the creative expression of the centering circuit is through the 5125. Mm -hmm. But I, I just know from my studies of the mystical stream that the mystical stream contains both tribal and individual, well, and also integration. And so basically the mystical mm -hmm. stream starts very tribal, and this is kind of the aspect of mysticism that has to do with the group. You know, whether it's a group doing seances or whether it's groups drumming and singing and dancing together to achieve trance or in the modern time going to all night festivals, listening to loud electronic music or, you know, th that's the group <laughs> aspect of mysticism. And I know that the, the 5125 is about leaving behind the group and turning inward to have your own inner, you know, inner vision. Mm -hmm. But, um, okay, let's see what... Um, well, and then also Ra himself was a 5125. So he says, I am a 5125. To be an initiator, you have to be invited to, you know, act to, to do it. So, you know, would you do my design, Ra? Oh, yes, I will. You asked for it, you'll get it. But it's the way that it works. It doesn't matter whether I'm a manifester. That's just the strategy for my overall mechanism. So I guess Ra is saying that even though he's a manifester, there's nothing in him that can you know, initiate somebody into human design if they're resisting it. They still have to invite him. Um, okay, so let's see what, um, I'm kind of scrolling to see where we get to the stuff about the creativity. Um, hmm. So he's saying that the 51 is like the warrior. And, um, well, let's see. Yeah, it's so hard when you're reading Rob because you know he'll he'll have a topic and then he'll just go off on another topic. For mm -hmm. I mean, I'm the same way. I, I can't I can't criticize him. <laughs> but he's saying how important it is for the fifty for the fifty one twenty five to have the warrior's perspective and to be kind of vigilant as a warrior. And he's saying that it's about entering into things correctly. You have to have the warrior's perspective step by step. Everything you enter into, you enter into correctly. When I do somebody's reading, I look at somebody's design, I see who they are, and I'm always so on, let's see, what, but I guess he's saying that he, so he's really just kind of harping on he has to be invited to this. But, but let me get to where the creative, um, creative part of it is. Okay. Well, he's not really, he's not really saying much about the creativity. It's, it's kind of a bust on this one. Um, I guess I'll just read what he says and we'll just go with that and then we can move on to the next one because at least we're here. Might as well just read it. Okay, so... John, I, yeah. you, you might want to... You, you're getting very low. I don't know if it's our computer here or... Oh, I can turn up the audio, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, I'll just talk closer to it. I think I just need to be close oh. to the mic. Is that better? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Just gonna, it's because it's cause I'm like... I'm like looking... I'm like lost in the book trying to find where, yeah. where he says something important and... Okay, I'll just, I'll, just, um, I'll just read what he says without reading it to myself first. I don't think it's going to be that relevant to, the, to this, but, um, but then we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so each of these different channels, are, which are part of my design, he's talking about himself now, or are part of anybody's design, they each have their own laws. Each has their own law rooted in type. So it doesn't mean that my... You know, initiation is always manifesting. Yeah. It's not true. You've got to ask for it. You've got to invite it. And if you ask for it, you get it. That's the way it works. So it's very important when you're looking at the nature of your design to look at the channels according to their type and see that each and every one of them has their own program. 
And the moment you're living out your type, that program automatically works. I'm not telling you that you have extra work to do. I don't have to worry about waiting to be invited to do a reading for somebody. As long as I'm alive, people are going to be asking me to do that. It's just there. It's the type that sets you free of having to get lost in all the nitty gritty. How do I deal with this? How do I deal with this channel? How do I deal with that? How do I do that? It's not about that. It really has to come to you, and it comes to you through the way you enter into things. The most important framework that you need in your own process, in the process of any client, is the recognition that how you enter into something determines it. So I, I think I'll stop on this one for now because he's kind of just using the 5125 as a jumping point f for talking about channels by type in general. But this is good because it is for the overall topic today, which is when, when you're looking at your chart, you're looking at um, your channels just to realize, I mean, if you're a projector, okay, all of your channels are projector channels. But if you're a generator, it's not, it's not the case. You may have a lot of projected channels. You might only have one generator channel. You're still a generator if you have even one generator channel. Um, but the rest of your channels might not work that way. And the same if, if you're a manifester, if you're a manifesting generator. So it's just kind of appreciating the mechanics of how that works. Now, the other thing that I really wanted to do here, particularly for the projectors, so we could do this with Eric and Julie and Esther um, and Michael, and it's, it's basically what does recognition of that channel look like to you? And my kind of go-to formula for that is when somebody, like it's not just the generic recognition, like say someone's 5125. Okay, great, a lot of people are 5125. Maybe some of them are just competitive, some of them are explorers, some of them are entrepreneurs doing things for the first time or inventors or who knows. But to really be recognized for 5125, my formula for the, the recognition is when somebody goes, wow, I've never met someone like that before. Like, they're so differentiated. They're recognizing the differentiation. Like, like if, if Bernie Sanders is being recognized for 5125, it's not just, oh, wow, he's the first presidential candidate to do this in some generic kind of sense. It's more like, like someone who really recognized him would be like, wow, I've never seen someone do this before. I've never seen this before. It's such a new, unique thing. And I do think that at some level, as homogenized as it is with the masses, there was some recognition. You know, you heard newscasters saying, wow, we've never had a presidential candidate like this before. We've never had someone talk about universal basic income and so on. Now, that's kind of the Xeroxed, homogenized version of it. But these things operate on many levels, and you can see the sort of low fidelity Xeroxed version play out on the homogenized political stage. And then mm -hmm. in a deeply personal sense, if you know a projector personally who has that 5125, um, you can talk about recognizing that in them. And even if you're not a projector, like even John, you know, he's not going to necessarily feel that sense of success from getting recognized in that way. Um, that a projector would, but still there is that question of when someone recognizes that element. You can kind of notice that, that what they're recognizing in that person is their own way of expressing it. I think the example Ra uses is, you know, there have been 25 different people who played Hamlet that he's seen in his life, but, you know, that one actor who plays Hamlet really owns the part and really makes it their own and plays Hamlet in a totally unique way that nobody else has ever done before. Um, and that's what it's really about. So I guess my two kind of goals here, you know, one is just to talk about the channels and what type of channel they are. And then the other is just for the projectors specifically um, to talk about what is it like to be recognized for that channel? You know, it's a real mm -hmm. interesting question. So, okay, so I'm just gonna ask if anybody else has the creative ones. And then once we move through the creative channels, uh, we can we can get on to some of the projector channels and some of the other ones. Um, okay, does anybody have the the 1057, the channel of perfected form? Esther. Esther has that one. I have that one. Yes. Oh, we both have it. Yes, I have it. I have both have it. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Guys, I'm so into me having it that it's got that on. <laughs> Well, and, yes, you, know, you share that. It's obviously going to be different being a projector and having a projector channel than being a generator. Yeah. Because for the generator, sure, that's going to be part of their overall makeup, but it's not really going to give the same sense of fulfillment 
being successful in that sense, it's not really about the success for the generator. Okay, so the 1057, um, I think it's on page 50 here, let me find it. So that's also a creative channel. And um, I'm gonna see what Ra has to say about it. So, let's see. And then, and then we can talk about perhaps what it is to be recognized for that, because I'd be curious, you know, um, I usually, my immediate association for that is somebody who knows who they are, or they have a deep knowledge of their own identity. That 57 is about knowing, and 10 is about personal identity. So one of the formulas I use is this is, these are people who know who they are. Um, my dad has that channel, and he seems to have a lot of self-knowledge about his identity. I also find it with a lot of artists, but funny enough, there's also people who aren't necessarily artists, or sometimes they are, but it's almost as if they are their own work of art. Um, I've seen it with a lot of models, like f f people who model for you know photos. I've seen it with athletes who kind of sculpt their bodies. Um, I'll answer your question in a, in a minute, Mike, so I'm gonna stick to this and we'll answer that, but thanks for asking. Okay. The 1057, perfected form. And also, Ra, Ra had this. Oh, funny. Wait, I just clicked something, and now I... Oh, it's captioning me. Do you all see that? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. funny. I clicked captions, and it's actually, uh, it's actually real-time captioning me. That's so funny. Okay. I turned Are we off. getting you right, Jonah? It was actually doing it pretty, pretty accurately. I was surprised. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the 1057, perfected form. You can see that when we're dealing with the creative channel of integration, the 1057, this channel of perfected form, you can see that it's rooted in the deepest of all fears, the very fear for your survival, the fear of tomorrow. And this fear is connected to the 10th gate. The fear is from gate 57. Now the 10th gate is a gate of the vessel of love, and it is the expression of love through behavior. It is the potential to love life itself. At its highest level is the potential for self-love. The 57th gate is a gate of intuition and it's a deeply acoustic gate. It is the gate of the right ear of hearing in the now. That is, perfected form is behavior that is conditioned by the right tonal environment, the right acoustic environment. Mm -hmm. The first thing to recognize about the creativity of 1057s is that they're always designing environments. They are our architects, our fashion designers. Oh, that's so interesting because my dad's a 1057, as I mentioned, and he, I always trusted him for his spatial awareness. He has such good spatial awareness. Like anytime I was moving and I had to pack the U-Haul, I would always ask him, I would move the boxes and he would be there at the U-Haul to like figure out the Tetris game of where to put the things because he was so good spatially. And he was always giving me advice of, you know, you should move your couch over here, you know, here it's in the way. And, it's, it's very true. It's interesting. I never actually thought of them. I always thought of it more as uh, perfecting their own form in the sense of like athletes or people who are kind of, you know, like Ra himself was, was typically very um, kind of sculpting his own body or in some sense he was the example of his own work of art. Uh, but it's, I, I guess I see what he's saying that it's actually not just perfected form of the body, but it's the perfected form of the environment as well. Mm. They design environments. That's their creativity. And they're designing environments in which survival will be guaranteed. An environment that provides protection of, from the fear of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, wow. and then um, he's saying something, some really interesting things here. Okay, I'm just going to read what he says. I mean, Ra really goes off on some tangents. Okay, the 1057 is potentially the most bisexual of all gates, of all channel systems, particularly when you're dealing with the 10th hexagram, and you're dealing with either the third or the fifth line. In other words, people that are abused emotionally can lead to a tendency through the 10th gate to create a different kind of environment in which love can survive. That environment can be bisexual. Homosexual. What does he mean by homosexual environment? I don't really understand. But okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter because it's not about the sex. It's about love and the environment of love. Very curious, Ra. I'm not, you know, is he, 
I mean, he had the 1057. Maybe he's talking about personal experience. I'd be curious to hear him elaborate. Okay, one of the things to recognize about the deep creativity, and then he just moves on. This is great. The deep creativity inherent in the 1057 is that because it is purely individual and because it is mutative, they truly can change the environment that we live in. They can literally mutate that environment and change those who are within the environment as a result. You're a little muffled. I don't know. Okay. I don't know why it's muffling now. It's um, I can turn it up. Or... I think when you're when you're down, when you're okay. facing you down. Okay. I'll do is I'll put this. Here we go. I have my uh, laptop here. I'll put it <laughs> yes. on this okay. side of the mic. And oh, that's that way. Good. Okay, there we go. <laughs> now I can read past the mic. That's perfect. Okay. Yeah, Thank this you. microphone is a little funky too. It's very directional. So I'm still experimenting with it. Yeah, if I just turn it just a little bit, it doesn't, it, it loses it. Okay. Um, it's important to keep in mind when you're looking at the 1057, the channel of perfected form. It sounds delightful, doesn't it? Well, the reality is that it's a projected channel. There is no power here, none. There is a weak immune system connected to the identity. I wonder why he would call it weak. I always think of the defined spleen as a strong immune system. Yeah, you know, it's always hard when you're reading Ra. It's like piecing together where he's coming from in all these different ways. And what we know is that it, about any projected element is that it requires recognition. It's essential for them. A projected channel is also a recognizing channel. It recognizes the forms. It recognizes the right environment or the wrong environment and those that are around it. It has that gift. I could make nicer clothes than that. It has that gift. And yet at the same time, it's a projected element, so it needs to be recognized. But more importantly, in order for it to get access to energy, it needs to be invited formally to that energy and the opportunity of that energy. The architect does not build the house. And the architect doesn't even do the drawing unless the money is there. It needs to be recognized and have access to the energy before that perfected form can come out. And it must be recognized. Think about the nature of bitterness. You see, these are people that go sour on love. They go sour on themselves. Remember this morning we were talking about type. One of the things that I referred to was always keeping in mind the equation of what is individual and what is emotional, because these are the forces of deep authority within the mechanism. When you're looking at the 1057, you're looking at an individual channel, and you're looking at melancholy. Oh, that's interesting. I guess he's saying that you know, someone has a logic channel, it's not going to actually affect them in the same way. If they have an individual channel, they're going to be dealing with moodiness. They're going to be dealing with this certain individual melancholy. And if they have an emotional channel connected to the solar plexus, they're going to be dealing with all of the emotion there. So it's a good point that he kind of gives extra weight to the emotional channels and to the individual channels. But, um, but when you're looking at the 1057, you're looking at an individual channel, and you're looking at melancholy. You're looking right at it. Now think about the 10th gate. It's a gate of love. Here's a gate of loving life, but you're melancholic. Sometimes you're happy with life. Sometimes you're sad with life because it's a melancholic chemistry, and it's about loving yourself. And again, that melancholy is a condition of whether you can or cannot love yourself. But it says even more than that. Think about the nature of what it is to be melancholic. Melancholy is a chemistry, and the chemistry creates an environment. The environment at one end we call sadness. That sadness is to be understood as a creative environment. Only. Only. That's what it's for. In that sadness comes out your creative potential. But the moment you give the sadness a reason, the moment you say, I'm sad because of this and that, and blah, 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 and all that stuff, the moment you identify with the chemistry, that's the moment you're lost. That's the moment that what is melancholy and a positive environment becomes a negative environment that we call depression. So the 1057s can be deeply depressed, and they can be depressed about their form. They can be depressed about their survival potential. They can be bitter that life is so tough. They can be bitter that they have to work so hard to get any kind of recognition. Any kind of recognition. The 1057 needs to be nurtured, and it needs to be nurtured by being recognized. So when you're looking at somebody's design and you see that 1057 there, it's so important for you to encourage these people to live out their design, live out their type, and so on. And as they do this, they will have a projected aspect that gets recognized. And I'll finish on the 1057 now, but here he has an um, example of Frida Kahlo, who has the 1057, a classic 1057, although she was an emotional manifester. 
Um, but he talks about how her creativity can come out through that 1057. Um, I, I guess I'll just read a little highlight from it. You, one of the things you'll notice when doing any research or studies on creative individuals is you'll see that channels that are entirely unconscious can produce all kinds of fascinating create, creativity. Her body graph shows that she has the entirely unconscious 5710. So that's kind of interesting. Is like you don't have to have it as a conscious channel. The fact that it's unconscious can actually be a benefit because it can purely express that creativity yeah. without interference from the mind. Um, it, so, yeah. And then he goes on to talk about Frida Kahlo. And I think I'll finish on that for now. But that's, yeah, that, that's a pretty interesting stuff there. I mean, um, yeah. Being recognized for creating environments. I mean, that's an interesting for fashion design, for architecture, interior design. And I still don't really know what he means about it being a bisexual environment. That part was, was very, like, I guess, does he just mean that it's environments that embrace all ways of life or that the environment itself is not like I was trying to think like like what's a masculine versus a feminine environment maybe it's that the 1057 can create environments that are going beyond the gender binary in some way it's not like a, a really masculine environment like the proverbial man cave and it's not a really stereotypically feminine quote-unquote yeah. environment either it's an environment that that goes beyond I, I honestly don't really know what, what he means by that. That was a very oblique statement by Ra. Yeah. I could interject in Please here. Do. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have been at uh, John and Esther's house numerous times, numerous houses. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Esther's design in, is, is amazing in the design of the home. And it is both feminine and masculine. Oh. She has, yeah, there's, uh, I could see that. And uh, it's just set up, it's so comfortable and it's unique. It, it's beautiful. I mean, the two of them, they, uh, wherever they're at, the design of their home and the comfort of it is just lovely. So I, I've noticed that over, I've been at one, two, three, three homes. Three, yeah. And this, yeah, yeah. And all are different completely different from each other um, and yet so all unique. And so, yes, I could see the where you're talking about maybe the, in the bisexual is just both sides, the masculine mm. and feminine. Oh, very cool. Of very that. Cool. Yeah, it's that very, very, a lot very of light cool. On it. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Mm -hmm. And I was trying yeah. to think back, um, there's a whole series that Ra calls Rave Anatomy which is basically a series he did on the biological associations of the gates. And I'm not able to recall where, where biological sex is in the body graph. I do remember that Ra said that one of the things that makes human design um, interesting compared to some other attempts of what he would call seven-centered mysticisms is that so many of the seven-centered mysticisms were so preoccupied with sex, with biological sex, and that they would have, and that human design is actually not. Like, human design is actually a, a design that goes beyond biological sex, which is so interesting. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I think maybe somewhere in Rave Anatomy, it could be Gate 57 that has something to do with, with gender and that, or sorry, not gender, but with biological sex. Um, and anyway, it's interesting. Um, Okay, so, uh, oh, I'm going to answer Mike's question, then we can go on to the, we can finish up on the, the creative channels, and then anybody who wants to talk about any other channels, we'll, we'll start doing it. So Mike's question is, when a generator has their personality sun in a projected channel, um, do they tend to focus on that channel? Well, I would say the personality sun is really ultimately about outer authority. Um, it's about what you're here to give to other people. So... If your personality sends in the gate of shock, like Ra wasn't his, didn't he have gate 51? Then what he's here to do is to rouse people through his rousing speeches, rousing the spirit and getting them all, you know, fired up and getting them all jazzed up and energized and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I think that wh wherever the personality sun is, is going to be basically where that person has the opportunity to most express their outer authority for others through the power of their mind. And mm -hmm. it's not really about, um, 
their decision making. And so, but I have noticed that when somebody is a generator, just in general, they might have like, like for instance, like split definition generator and the, the split is on a projected channel, which is pretty common, then they often think that they're like a projector. Like I know one person who um, has a split on a projected channel and he's always talking about how he, 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 he read the different types and he said, well, I read the types and it says I'm a generator, but I think I'm a projector. And I was like, well, that's not possible unless you have the wrong birth time. Then I looked at his chart and saw that he's split definition and it's a projected channel. And I was like, oh, well, this is obviously it. Like he thinks he's a projector. And I asked why he thinks that. And he said, well, because my whole life I've been guiding people and helping to guide them and help, you know, coaching them and showing them the right way and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but are you satisfied by that? You know, who knows? So, okay, let's do the rest of the creative uh, channels. Let's just see who has them. Because this is interesting. Like, I, I th this is what I wanted to get out of this is that I never knew the 1057 was an environment creator. You know, like that was its creative expression. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's cool. I really like that. So, yeah. you, know, you know what, Jonah? I, yeah. What I found interesting when you were reading from Ra was that this whole idea of it being melancholic, that somehow when you ident try to identify what it is that you're feeling sad or melancholic about, you go into this loop, you know, rather than just having the experience, you know, like not trying to identify what the experience is, but rather just kind of going with it, you know, but, Absolutely. I, I, oh. I thought that was, I thought that was interesting because I sometimes feel like that, but I'm not always interested to know why I feel like that. You know, like sometimes because, like I'm defined in the head as well, the sixty four forty seven. So I'm I'm always like sort of trying to figure things out, right? Mm -hmm. But when I just let it go, it just passes. It's just like you know, like a cloud, right? And but, well, and that's so valuable. And also, I think a lot of it is about, I mean, he didn't mention it here, but I think in that melancholic state, it's really important to be alone in your own aura with nobody else's aura interfering with your aura. It's like, I know that, you know, because everybody feels moods at different times. Yeah. I've had a long term transit of um, I have hanging gate 12. And Neptune's been in gate 22 for six months or however long it's been. And I know that I've been getting very moody as I have this individual channel transit. And the best thing for me to do is just go for a walk. And, it, you know, I might be, maybe I had plans with somebody. We're supposed to watch a movie. We're supposed to do something. Um, I mean, you know, Jenny's been, you know, she also, she's, she's seen this. And she also has hanging gate 12 and has been learning the same kind of thing where if you're not in the mood to watch the movie, just turn off the movie and go for a walk. And something about being in your own aura. And yeah, you're absolutely right, Esther, that trying to explain it is the wrong direction. Like, I, I like how Ra says, on the one hand, you have the melancholic environment, and you think on the other hand, he's going to be like some happy environment. He's like, no, the other hand is the depressive environment. And the melancholic <laughs> is the positive one, and the depressive one is the negative one. And I like that he's yeah, contrasting yeah. melancholy and depression, yeah. and melancholy is the good one. So, like, yeah. just to remember and that, yeah. If you're John, there, and also, yeah. Esther, you have the hanging gate 12 on an open throat, and it's your only gate, right? Oh. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so you're also yeah. feeling that gate 22. Neptune's been in gate 22 since, yeah. I don't know, January, February. Yeah. Maybe Mike knows. Um, but it's been there for a while. And yeah, so everyone with hanging gate 12 has had this melancholic, but also kind of exciting, like channel of poetry and romance and song mm. lyrics. And yeah. it's a good time to write poetry. So. Yeah, and you know what? If you have a partner that you're living with that's not in that vibe, you know, not like there, like John's constantly trying to figure out what's going on, you know. Oh. And I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I always can explain what it is that's going on, mm. which doesn't necessarily <laughs> lead to good things. Lead to good things between well, us. Yeah, it's it's just how important it is when you're when the individual melancholy clicks in. It's just time to be alone, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you can see um, 
how people go, what's wrong? Can I do something for you? Can I this or that? It's just mood. It's just moodiness. You know, people get in moods and it's just let them be in a mood. And you can just have a little joke and be like, oh, the mood, the, you know, the, the mood fairy is here. So go for a walk or whatever, you know. So. <laughs> I'm feeling you tried to make that a little feminine. <laughs> okay, or the, the mood gremlin. Excuse me, the mood the mood goblin. <laughs> yeah, give me the give me anything the yeah the mood spirit. Um, Jenny, Jenny was laughing in the comments. Um, okay, well, let's see what other creative channels there are. So, does anyone have the thirty five thirty six here? No. No. Okay. Uh, how about the sixteen forty eight? That's a good I one. Do. Oh, you have that uh, one. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I have uh I know a few people personally who have that one and it's it's usually just so good at um I don't know, just like mastering things. They're just like real <laughs> masters. You know, they just do it so many times and it could be something like playing a concerto or it could just be like mastering the best scrambled eggs or like whatever, you know, and it's logical. So there is a very definite best. It's not yeah. individual Repeating. where there's like all this no comparison yeah. stuff. It's like, no, 1648 is here to compare and it's here to say there's a best and a worst and where mm -hmm. am I in the spectrum and all that stuff. Okay. So, um, let me get Jonah, there. this is also the gate of death, right? So 48 is, Absolutely. Yeah. this is Barbara for yeah. sure. Oh yeah. Yes. This is Barbara. Yeah. Yeah, expertise, <laughs> mastering, all this stuff. So, okay, so let me just read a little from uh, from this now. Okay, yeah, because I'm curious about it as create. I mean, everyone I've met who has that channel seems to be creative in some form or another. Oftentimes, musical talent, but it could also be artistic or even just, but it could be anything really. It's just about the repetition and the perfection it's like a different meaning of the term perfection. Like per the perfected form we were talking about is all about the uniqueness of individual expression. You know, that 5710 perfection is like the perfection of uniqueness. This is the perfection of just doing it so many times that you, you've practiced so much that you can play it perfectly without mistakes or you can perform it so well. Um, okay, so. Um, un the understanding circuit, logic, channel 1648, the channel of the wavelength, a design of talent. It's the creative channel of the understanding circuit. Interesting. The creative process of logic. The creative process, as it applies to the logic system, is something that has enormous impact on all of our lives. Whenever you're looking at logic, you have to recognize that the understanding circuit represents the only way in which everyone can get access to something that is reliable. In other words, we're very dependent on the logic process to educate us and to be able to prepare us for the future, which is what the logic process is all about. It's about preparation for the future, the ability to be able to establish patterns, to be able to establish that patterns are reliable, and to project those securely into the future. So it's very important to notice the difference between the collective creative processes. The easiest thing in the world to get is experience. This is like our last week's talk about the experiential stuff. After all, the fact that the creative experiential way is a manifesting and an emotional manifesting channel, you know that that can be released at any given moment. That experience is something that's a dime a dozen. There are all kinds of experiences that are available all the time. At least talking about um, its, cor its correlation on the other side is the 3536 or the 3635. That's the mirror yeah. image of it. And that's the creative experiential one. Right. He's saying... Yeah, that's a dime a dozen. You know, if you want to have an experience, yeah, go out there and get the experience. It's everywhere. But now this is raw again. But to become a master, that's tough. And it's tough for a very obvious reason. If you look at the 1648, which is the purest creative channel, and you look at that throat connected to the spleen, what you have in that instantaneously, you've got projection. It's a projected channel. It's not a dime a dozen. It can't happen all the time. As a matter of fact, it's excruciatingly difficult for that true talent to come out because it's not about the talent being expressed. It has a voice after all. 
but it's about what that logical talent actually represents. Logical talent represents the capacity to be able to be focused and concentrated and to be able to repeat endlessly the same thing over and over again in a perfecting process. So, and then he um, says the root of the talent is in the 1858. Now, the 1858 being the channel of judgment, a design of insatiability, is that is there in order to guide the talent process, which is about perfecting what can never be perfected. You can be the greatest masters of anything, and there will always be a place within you that you recognize there's still somewhere to go. Life is short after all. Show me a 300-year-old master, and I'll show you a better master than an 80-year-old master, because it's about repetition and time. It's about the endless process of examining the patterns and working with the patterns. You know, I, I have a little uh, side side anecdote about this. I forget who it was, but there was a famous concert violinist. And he said, if I don't practice for one day, I know. If I don't practice for two days, my critics know. If I don't practice for three days, my audience knows. <laughs> it's That's daily nice. practice, never yeah. ending. It's like, it's not like you just practice to a point and you're like, I'm done. <laughs> you know, it's keeping it up. It's all that. So when you look at the throat and the mystery of the throat, the mystery of manifestation and the logical aspects, the 1762, the 317, the 1648, they're all projected. In other words, none of those possibilities of logic can simply just jump out there. They can't. And because of that, we have what we call bureaucracies. <laughs> and then this is the, the header of this is that logic is starved. We have endless, endless discussions about action. It goes on forever. Everybody who wants to get their experiment done is going around begging for energy, begging for money. Logic is starved. When we get to looking at the generating channels, we'll come to the 15-5 um, and so on. But you'll see there's only one channel um, that is in common between mammals and reptiles in the various forms. It's the 15-5. All forms of life from the single cell onward, all of them meet in that channel. All of them. It's the universal, the universal principle of life as we know it. And it means that the ability to be able to express mastery is essential for all life. The 15-5, which is rooted in the 15's love of humanity, is that without the ability to master things that, you, that humanity cannot be properly guided into the future. And if you look at the, the uh, 31 7, you'll see that the guidance that's possible for humanity the, and this is the one that's part of the channel of the Alpha um, and the incarnation cross of the Alpha that Mike has. It's And you have that one too, Barbara? Do you have the 317? Or am I misremembering? Yes. Yeah, you have that Yes, also. seven, and my sun sign is seven. That's right. Yeah. So that 317, the, the guidance that's possible for, huma for humanity has to be elected. It has to get its energy from somewhere. And it means the skills in the 317, those are the skills that we're only going to appreciate if they're masterly. So, and so Ra's going quite, I mean, he, I think he talks for about 12 pages about this, so we don't have to go into all of it. But already this is an interesting thing to realize. I mean, he's kind of talking about, you know, that the, the logical mastery um, needs fuel. It needs fuel from somewhere. And also that it's uh, splenic, which is interesting. He says here, Mastery makes us feel good. That's the, that's, that's the header. Because <laughs> the spleen is where we get the feel good. So when you're looking yes. at the nature of talent or the nature of the perfected form, either the 5710 or that, that 4816, you're talking about creativity that's fundamentally healthy. That's interesting. Like they do, you know, I've heard scientists say and so on that playing piano and practicing, you know, keeps your brain really sharp and all this stuff. And it is a good point. It's like doing these kind of splenic, channels is actually like a healthy you know creativity it's not a creativity that's you know if you go over to the experiential side you know oh mountain climbing you know that can get you killed but i mean this is like <laughs> you know yeah. it's just by piano yeah 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 it's very rare for someone to yeah. be injured playing <laughs> playing the piano yeah. i actually grew up uh young in grammar school playing the piano Oh, uh, and I have a piano. Yes. And my, the three, I have two sisters and the three of us all took lessons uh, and I was uh, the one who could do it easily compared to the two. They said, we're just kind of doing it, but you really are good at it. 
Yeah. And I would, uh, I had to, my professor like made us memorize. Oh. So I had to memorize like 20 songs, like some ridiculous amount of, of stuff. And I loved it. I mean, I could do it over and over and over again. So Absolutely. it is fun. You know, yeah. it's, it really, I've seen it in action. I've seen 4816s start playing a game that they never played before and just be lousy and within two hours through that trial and error each time fixing one little yeah. mistake dri drip by drip and then pretty soon they've they've solved it yes um, i just want to read this because it's so funny this is what Roz saying about you know health the, the healthy part when you're looking at the nature of talent the nature of perfected form you're talking about creativity that's fundamentally healthy now the fact of the matter is that the abstract way is never fundamentally healthy it just isn't it's on the other side of the track I like that. <laughs> so when you're dealing with the immune system, you have to see that one of the reasons we have such a deep appreciation of mastery is that it makes us feel good. When you hear a fine musician play, or you look at a great painting, or you watch a good film, it makes you feel good. This is the beauty of this kind of art. It is strictly out of the immune system. It also means that for the person who engages in the process of mastery, that this is a fundamentally healthy life. So often when you look at the great masters, whether they're great painters or musicians, they're having children at 80. They live forever. <laughs> My heroes, people like uh, Buñuel, they put him in his grave when he was near 90. He was creating up to the last moment. Picasso, all of these people. Um, I have a good friend, Von Paul, who has the 4816. 71 years old, draws for hours every day. So, and then, um, but then he's saying, but it can't generate. And, the, and if it doesn't have opportunities, it can't just manifest. So it needs to have recognition. The 4816 has no real power to practice. Think about a child that only has the 4816 and nothing else. You cannot invite that child to be a piano player. You're going to torture them because they have no consistent access to energy. And this is a solo instrument. They'll do great when their teacher is sitting beside them, if their teacher happens to motorize them. But the moment that teacher is gone, there's no power to practice. Oh, yeah, there are transits, but there's no real power there. So that's interesting. So, yes. yeah, having that 4816 as a generator, sure, you have your own little energy mm -hmm. dynamo that wake up with a full tank of gas every morning, you know. But um, yeah. I know two projectors, actually, it's really interesting. And one of them is a 1-3 and the other is a 2-4. And they're friends. And they both only have the 4816. And it, it's interesting. Huh? I'm, I'm thinking about them now. Yeah. And one's an artist and the other's a writer. But they both struggle quite a bit with, you know, the guilt of, you know, the undefined ego guilt of being lazy and what's wrong with me. I don't have the energy to do this. And why am I not producing the body of work other people are doing? And and, right. you know, it, it's interesting. It's almost like if they want to really um, use that, then they, they're going to need somebody who recognizes and invites them and really has the energy that they're guiding then and has that energy to sit with them and or be in a band together or do some sort of group activity or. Yeah, it's so interesting. Right. It's so interesting. And a generator. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Even just a projector with the root defined would be better. But yeah, I mean. But yeah, a generator would be ideal. Generator to plug into and to work for them and so on. Um, and oh, and then here's what Ra is saying is the bitterness of that channel. And what comes out of it when they don't have that energy is the real bitterness. I can't play. I'm not good enough. All rooted in the genetic continuity of logic. The continuity of logic is always saying the same thing. I'm not good enough. It always says it. Logic always says that. But you have to remember, this is not to be taken personally. It's not a personal circuit. Mm -hmm. Understand very clearly that nothing that operates out of the collective is personal. The moment you take it personally, you've got a handful of problems. And then right. the next, uh, I, I'll, I'll move on now, but the next one he has is the title is The Self-Flagellation of the Logic Process. <laughs> and he goes on to talking about uh, the 1858s and uh, the always the could be better, the not good enough. Um, and so on. So, okay, well, let's, um, oh, and also, I, yeah, I'll just mention as a side note, the gate 48, uh, I think is the fear of inadequacy or the fear of not being good enough too, which makes sense. Yeah. in what he's talking about here with that, that logic okay. is always so self-critical. Okay. Let's see what else we have for the creative, unless there's any more comments on the, on the 4816. 
Um, we're getting through the creative channels. So I think there's only one more. Let me see what it is. Oh, the 4426, which Jenny mm -hmm. has. So that's yeah. a creative one. Oh, and then there's the 596. So those are the last two. Does anyone have the 596 here? Okay. Yeah. So my sister does. I know. Yeah, I know her well, Kathleen. Yeah, yeah, I have I have some good friends who have that one. I've talked about it a bit. But let's just do it. We'll, we'll do the 4426 for now. And then if we want to do the 596, we can after. So the 4426. Yeah, it's also interesting to think of that as a creative channel, because I guess I understand it with entrepreneurship and kind of creating yeah. enterprises or creating projects, creating businesses, creating organizations, things like that. Um, so let's see, 44. And, and would, would you say also like creating um, the presentation of those, like how people see it, like how you, you know, unroll all of the different elements of said well, I, business? I, yeah, I definitely Jack. think of 26 as uh, selling it. I mean, it's a great salesperson. So, yeah. And then that's a greeter, right? Yeah. yeah. And I could see the greener. totally. I could see twenty six as, uh, and also like I think of like Don Draper and Mad Men getting up mm -hmm. in front of everybody and having all that nerve to sell. You know, I, I remember there's an episode of Mad Men where there's been a plane crash, and mm -hmm. he wants to do a brand for them, and they're all trying to be really careful and they're trying to emphasize safety, and he comes back yeah. with some really audacious, flashy, big thing to try to like you know. It, it, that, that that kind of so in that sense, I think presentation is very important. Um, but let's see what Ross says about it, because also this is interesting because we're looking at creativity by circuit, also not just by type. I mean, here again we have a projected channel, but also like we're kind of comparing like what is the difference between like individual creativity? We just looked at we just looked at collective logic creativity. Now we're looking at tribal creativity. So what is the tribal creativity? And uh, Mike has the comment. It's also selling, like making applicable. Just being able to tell someone what is going on right now is selling. Okay. Yeah. Like just kind of just, just making it relevant. And being, uh, yeah. So, okay. So here is now the idea of tribal creativity. And... Um, Tribal circuitry, that has, so tribal creativity has two channels, the 59.6 and the 44.26. Tribal creativity serves the needs of the tribe. The tribe. Everything about the tribe is based in their keynote of support. Tribal circuitry is about support. It's about a deep involvement in that tribal creativity is there to serve the tribe. Tribal creativity is intended to be as productive and valuable to the tribe as any other activity within the tribe. In other words, if you're going to be a painter in the tribe, you're probably going to be a sign painter rather than being an artist because a sign painter brings value to the tribe in their efforts. And then he goes into, let's see, ego creativity is a product of willpower. In other words, the creativity that's inherent in the tribe is creativity that serves the needs of the tribe. And need is a keynote when it comes to the tribe, when it comes to any kind of tribal creativity. The nature of the tribal circuitry is that its focus point, rather than being the throat, is the ego. That's another interesting th point about the tribal circuitry. It all focuses on the ego. It all flows toward the ego, not the throat. So what we're looking at here is ego creativity. And it's the only example, other than the 5125, of ego creativity. Creativity as a result of willpower. In other words, creativity that's not a product of the muse, but a product of willpower. The moment that creativity is subject to the muse, that's the moment that it cannot consistently serve. And tribal creativity is meant to consistently serve. The tribe is not going to put up with an artist that's not productive. It's not going to put up with somebody who has to go through a long learning process before they can see the benefits of it. And the tribe will only support tribal creativity when it sees that it's to its advantage. And it enhances the values inherent in whatever that tribal community happens to be. The 4426, surrender, the transmitter. So here at this stage, we're going to look at the 4426, the channel of surrender, a design of being a transmitter. A classic example of that is someone who creates tribal creative materials and those materials that are there to serve the tribe. The fact that the materials can have an aesthetic value that one considers artistic is beside the point. 
It's beside the point. The value of it is how successful it is in getting the tribe to use the creativity. That's what it's about. Possessiveness, exaggeration, and trickery. What that creative process brings, it has to bring value to the tribe. In other words, it's something worthwhile ha having. And having is very important because everything about the tribe is about possessiveness. What I have, what I don't have, what we have, what we don't have. Think about how the tribe operates. The creativity of the tribe is an act of exaggeration. One of the most important aspects of the tribe is trickery. The tribe is inherently conservative. They don't like change. They don't want new things if the old thing works. And one of the gifts of tribal creativity is to give everyone the impression that what's new is better than what's old. I think that's, I think that's probably backwards. I think he meant what's old is better than what's new because oftentimes these transcriptions have, have little reversals. Now that's an exaggeration. However, the tribe will not accept anything unless it's been exaggerated. The tribe will never jump into something unless it's fooled. God, Ra is so, is so dark in these. The 26th gate, manipulation of memory and trickery. This 26th gate, the taming power of the great. This is the pure manipulation of memory, the gate of the trickster, the gate of the salesperson, the gate of the marketer. Now, as we all know, tribal marketing is rooted in its exaggeration in order to trick people to leave their conservatism behind. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so I guess it was not a reversal. I guess what he said before was not a typo, that it's actually here to exaggerate. That's so interesting. So it's tribal, but it's trying to get the tribe to accept something new. This is where it's creative. This is why it's creative. Okay, now it's making sense to me. The rest of the tribal circuitry is just stuck yeah. there going, we have our tradition, we have our things, we don't want anything new. The 4426 comes along and is actually saying, no, I'm going to get you to do something new. I am creative. I'm going to introduce something new to the tribe, but I have to trick you into doing it <laughs> because the tribe just doesn't want. So tribal marketing is rooted in its exaggeration in order to trick people to leave their conservatism behind and enter into something new. So what you do is you tell them there's a new feature and that new feature is absolutely incredible. Now, it may not be absolutely incredible. However, if you can manage to trick the tribe into thinking they need that, they'll buy it. And the tribe isn't going to take anything into its life unless it needs it, which means you've got to trick them. It's so funny. They're not like yeah. doing things out of yeah. just like willy nilly. They're, you know, you have to trick them like you need this. You can't live without it. You can't survive without it. Oh. oh. Okay. The 4426 has an unusual capacity and has a capacity that in some degree is related to the... Julie? Yeah. Oh, you're leaving, Julie? Oh, thanks for joining. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. So this is interesting. So the 4426 is in some degree related to the 4816. What we've seen in the logical process and logical creativity is that because logical creativity is rooted in the splenic system, it can be inherently healthy. Well, one of the most dynamically, potentially healthy channels in the body graph is the 4426, the 44th gate coming out of the immune system itself. And at the same time, meeting the 26th gate at the other end, which is the gate of the thymus gland, the gate where our T cells are produced, the T cells that are absolutely essential for us in being able to combat alien viruses, bacteria, whatever. It's the 4426, that in a prenatal stage, in a conceptual stage, actually begins the development of the immune system itself. And Mike has the comment, associated with smell, because smell has been with us the longest, evolutionarily speaking, as a value check. Smell bad? Scary. Interesting. Okay. The thymus gland orchestrates the development of the immune system. So the 2644 carries with it health benefits. But it carries something interesting. You see, the 44th gate is the pure lymphic system. It's an alert system. The 44th gate itself is a gate of alertness. It's a gate that's there to be able to recognize what needs to be controlled, what needs to be manipulated, in order to get the tribe involved in something. But when you're dealing with the 26th gate by itself, you have to realize the 26th gate, because it's the place where the T cells are, can be deeply destructive deeply destructive, not in the negative sense that we understand that, deeply destructive in the positive sense of what a T cell is. The T cell is one of the great warriors, the greatest warriors this planet has ever seen. It eats the enemy alive. It kills them instantaneously and swallows them down. So this is 
creativity that works best when it's destroying something. The fact of the matter is, when you're dealing with the 4426, you're dealing with an unusual creativity because it's a creativity that works best when it's destroying something. Think about that. It only works best when it's destroying something and replacing it with something new. Yes. How many times have you looked at an advertisement on television and it says new or new and improved or brand new and improved or super brand new and improved? And it goes on and on and on. And what that, that's actually saying is this is new. The old stuff's crap. Forget it. Same brand name. Yeah. Forget the old stuff. It's great for rebranding. Yeah. This is actually, this is great. This is great for you, Jenny. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> she works at her best <laughs> when she's destroying the old brand. Get rid of yeah. the old brand. Yeah. That shade of red yeah. was terrible. You want this shade of red. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, it's terrible. Negative advertising. One of the inherent capacities in the 4426 is the destruction of tribal standards and their replacement with a new standard. When the ego tries to destroy something, it better have a good replacement. It's not anarchy. It's the recognition that you can only succeed with the tribe when you can replace what they already have. So what we get out of that is negative advertising. The Pepsi Coca-Cola challenge. Coke tastes like that, but I like Pepsi. Only in America. <laughs> <laughs> you never see this in Europe. Only in America do you see commercials in which the competitors are displayed on screen and shown to be not of value. This is a terrible product. You shouldn't have been using this. Ours is better. It picks up more liquid. It does more of this. It does more of that. Whatever the case may be. Yeah. No other creativity survives purely on replacement. No other creativity has this capacity. No other creativity. So it's an essential ingredient to recognize that the 4426 can only be successful by knocking something. It's successful when they can see out of their creativity that what somebody already has isn't good enough and they can do better. And part of doing better is to convince them what they have isn't good enough. Otherwise, you'd never have a car market. You wouldn't have any of these things. These products that have lasted 30 or 40 years, they've gone through all kinds of updating because if you don't update them, they die. If you don't come along a year later and say new and improved, you die. So built into the tribe is a recognition, a recognition that what they have is replaceable. This is the conditioning of tribal circuitry, sorry, tribal creativity. Tribal creativity says, this is the product you get today, but I'm going to come back tomorrow and give you a new version so I can keep you interested in this product. So he kind of goes on talking about it um, and that it's the channel of the transmitter. You know, what is it, what is it really transmitting? Um, of course, one of the great dilemmas for people who carry this energy is that because it's creative and because creativity is lumped together, all these seven different aspects of creativity are lumped together, that this idea that their art should be appreciated, their creativity should be appreciated, is something that disturbs them. They can become quite bitter about that because their role is to replace. Their role is not to be the great artist. It's different. Their art is in their capacity to be able to transmit to the community a new standard. And the moment that they can replace something, that's the moment they're successful. The moment somebody gives up astrology and gets into human design, someone with that 40, 426 is successful. That's the real success. It's always about replacing something. It's somebody coming in and saying, I used to think this was the way and this was the way, but now you showed me there's a new way. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that's good on that one. He keeps going on about it, but I think that that gets the point. So, yeah. Well, how are we all doing? We've been about an hour. Do we want to do... I feel like I think we've done enough with the creative circuitry. We mm -hmm. can continue next week with some of the yeah. channels by type. Um, let's do let's do the 59.6 just because it'll be fun because it's always yeah. kind of... Uh, and also because the way Ross starts it, I just turn to it. And Ross says, uh, he starts it by saying, 59.6, reproductive creativity. I saved <laughs> sex for last. Good way to finish the, af the afternoon. <laughs> I, hope I arouse all of you with my purient approach. Prurient. What does that word even mean? God. Prurient. It's like prudent. Prurient. Oh, it just means interested in sex. Okay. Prurient. What a hard word to say. So, okay. 59.6. Reproductive creativity. And this is, of course, from the sacral to the solar plexus. The channel of mating. A design focused on reproduction. Part of the defense circuit. Headline, it's not like painting a picture. <laughs> That's a good headline. <laughs> what, what, what kind of creativity is he talking about here? It's not, not painting a picture. <laughs> I saved sex for last, a good way to finish the afternoon. I hope I arouse all of you with my prurient approach. Tribal creativity is what keeps us all going. 
we've already seen that the creativity inherent in the 4426 is driving us to continue our improving business and keep us deeply connected to each other financially and materially and all the things that come with that the establishment of class and all of these things but when you get to the 596 the last of our seven creative channels you get to a creativity that is inherently reproductive it's the real thing it's about as creative as you can possibly imagine there's truly nothing more creative than that it is the capacity to create life itself and of course the whole thing about the tribe is that it can never really claim to be the artist tribal creativity is not about that only an individual like me will turn to their kids and say you got great genes for me I tell that to Sarah all the time you got all the great genes for me <laughs> <laughs> but the tribe does not operate in that way. In other words, it's not about, and the dilemma in the reproduction of children is the possessiveness that comes with it. I created this being. It's mine, and I'm going to do with it what I like because it's mine. I made it. Well, it's not like painting a picture. The 596 is the most complex of all of the, or yeah, most complex of all of the creative channels because of its very structure. You're dealing with emotional generation. I made the comment yesterday about how many women will say, why did I have children with that man? And it's one of the most common things that I meet, that kind of statement. Well, there's nothing dumber than the 59.6. Nothing blinder. It's only creative as a, in terms of its results. It creates life, but that's a biological, physical game, and we're designed to do that. There isn't anybody who doesn't come into this world that has a capacity to be creative at this level. That doesn't, I think, he means to say that doesn't have a capacity. It's there for all of us. You don't need a degree to make love. You don't have to have all of that backing. You don't need all that talent and so forth. Sex is sex, and it starts all on its own. It gets you going. Going, The hormones pop up, and there you are. So it's not like you can say, hey, you know, I'm really creative. <laughs> okay. Uh, the 59, sexual strategy. First of all, the emotional system. Look at what you're dealing with when you're dealing with your sacral and the emotional system. You're dealing with the two cores of our, sexual, of our sexuality. The sacral system releases the genetic code for sexual mating. In other words, sexual strategy. We've looked at that in the sexuality course, the first part of that. Yeah, because gate 59 has six lines, and each of those lines is a sexual bonding role. That's where we get the pursuer-pursued theme of the first line, and that's where we get the confidant theme of the fourth line and so on. All of the sexual bonding comes out of gate 59. Um, so the line things of gate 59. Oh, and he, he kind of goes over it here. I'll just skip over it pretty quickly. With the first line, that's the caveman or the cavewoman. You go out there, whack him over the head, and drag him home. The second line is about shyness. You have the other come to you and break down your barrier. The third line is kind of anarchistic. You get in and get out. The fourth line is that you can only make love to them if they're a friend. The fifth line is you've got to seduce them or seduce them into seducing you. And the sixth line is, excuse me, fuck like hell and give up early. <laughs> this is raw. I'm just quoting what he says. <laughs> and then sit on the fence and watch everybody else. So we have these strategies that are inherent in the 59th gate. These are the sexual strategies. But then he goes on to say, the sacral is sexual. The solar plexus is sexy. And I think that's the interesting thing here, and I've said this before too, that the, the fertility comes from the sacral center, but all of the allure and all of the, the excitement and all of the adventure and all of oh. that comes from the solar plexus. So on the solar plexus side, you get to the sixth gate and the emotional system, and that's where the sexy part is. The sexual strategy is never sexy by itself. When you meet somebody and they have a defined sacral and they don't have a defined emotional system, you're not going to find them sexy. They may be sexual, but they're not sexy. Sexy comes out of the emotional system. Sexy is where the pleasure wave is, and this is the wave that you get to pick up. But the sexual is right there in the sacral center. Sexual meaning that built into us is a genetic system that says we must reproduce. It's a genetic imperative. If everybody stops having children, human beings are finished. So it's a fundamental imperative in us. My whole thing about people entering into things correctly, I have a deep concern about children. I have had that most of my life. The fact of the matter is, is that our sexual bonding is so chaotic that the byproduct is that children come into the world in which, into a world in which they are not properly loved or nourished. They can't be because of the tensions that exist between the very people that brought them into the world. And those tensions exist because those people were not clear in entering into their relationship. Not clear. 
there is nothing dumber than reproductive sexuality. Oh, it's beautiful creatively. I've watched my children come into the world. It's really incredible. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed. It wasn't as if I was patting myself on the back and saying, boy, that's a good one. You did well this time. Just the creative experience to see life come into the world and to recognize it's a part of us. But nothing is more important than entering into a relationship correctly. The way the 59.6 operates is so dumb that even though bringing life into the world is beautiful because it keeps the species going, the sexual relationships derived out of the sexual bonding are disasters. There's nothing more distorting than that. How many people in my generation have had broken families, who've created broken families, who've left children, who've ended up with all kinds of complex family situations and structures, all of which is out of the nature of how they entered into the relationship in the first place. Nothing is more important for you as a human being to be able to enter correctly than being able to enter correctly into a relationship with the other. Everything begins with the correctness of that entry. So, okay, so anyway, he kind of goes on about it, but... Um, yeah, I I think this is uh, this is a good place to end. But uh, oh, and this is another interesting one. He says, "The fifty nine and six transits bring divorce conditioning." So he says, "Every two hundred and fifty years, we have a cycle of Pluto that brings disruption into relationships. Ever since the Second World War, we've had Pluto transits to the fifty nine and to the six in Virgo. That whole Pluto and Virgo generation, in which the standard of relationships has been turned upside down because it brings nothing but divorce. We've also had in our era both Neptune and Uranus passing through Virgo. So we've had a vast number of human beings that have been conditioned from birth to get divorced." It's there, designed to break relationships, designed to walk away from them. So, yeah. But anyway, he goes on about it. He's talking about, uh, he's kind of getting into some other topics. I think this is a good place to end, though. But it's, uh, I guess, a good place to end. He ends on clarity eliminates the mess. So he says it's really only a mess if you're not clear. That no matter if you have solar plexus defined or not, whatever, that sexuality is a solar plexus matter, you better have clarity about it. So yeah. if you've got the genetic strategy of the second line of shyness, where your sexual strategy is the other person has to break down your barrier, well, you've got to make them work at it. You've got to tell them that's the way you are. You want something from me? Come and get it. Come and ask for it. Knock on my door. I'm not going to offer it to you. And so he's, he's saying, like, it's important to have not only clarity in yourself, but clarity of communication. Like, be clear and be honest about it. Um, he says it's the right tools for honesty. We don't know how to be honest in our relationships because we've never had the right tools. Our attempts at being honest have been the attempts of the not self. What this knowledge does for us is to provide us with opportunities for true clarity and honesty in our relationships. And you can't get that honesty and clarity out after consummation. It doesn't work. You've got to get it out before consummation so everybody knows what they're dealing with. It's astonishing to discover how different that kind of relationship can be. It's based on mutual understanding and respect. So, yeah. Wow. Interesting, interesting stuff. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think, oh, then we have a comment from Mike. Pluto and Virgo is the only generation without a name. They were annexed into boomers and Gen X on either side. Pluto and Leo and Pluto and Libra. Oh, that's funny. I never, I didn't think about that. That's so funny. Well, Thank you. That's I, I think great. it's been a good one. Yeah. Yeah, do you have some, yeah. some comments, Barbara? Would you like to, to comment? Um, around the 4426, uh, my daughter and her boyfriend have, and I think a gym, and so Esther um, Elizabeth's gym also has the 4426, oh, right? Yeah, Barbara knows this, so I don't even know that. Yeah, I, and I find, and my son has the 26 <laughs> hanging gate, but also the 45, the king. And um, I, when he moved into the area, he lived well, a couple hours away. He got married uh, three, four years back. And um, he talked his wife into moving to this area very close to us. We're like seven streets away. Uh, my ex-husband's another street further away. And um, he talked her into the salesman. Talked her into moving close by. Rumson was a great town to live in. And he said, oh, at, well, my whole family lives here. So when we have children, you'll have people to help out <laughs> once we have kids. And it was just so funny. And I thought, 
he, and she thought, yes, this is a great idea because she did want children. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we end up, you know, they have a, our, my first grandchild with them. And we do watch them a couple of days a week now with the whole COVID thing. And um, what happens is, is she says, well, let's ask your parents or uh, my, uh, their the grand the grandfather us my my husband loves you know hanging out with her and so he ends up saying oh don't bother them and i'm thinking you sold her on this whole thing yeah. about us being around you know it was just so funny when i read the 26 uh the gate you know the hanging gate there Oh, about yeah. the snake oil oh, salesman yeah. or the whatever. Time. You know? I mean, I, I have it, and it's an undefined <laughs> ego, which is even more intense in certain ways. And, of course, Ra yes. had it in his defined ego. And, you know, Ra mm -hmm. wow, yeah. was that. And then, you know, Jenny has it. and um, As a it, channel. Right? channel yeah. So it takes on its own yeah. quality there. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Which is funny. So I, Alec, is my son, is his is on an undefined ego so yeah yes yeah so it, it, it was it was comical you know when i first saw that i was like ah i remember those comments yeah yeah so i say keep asking us my dear uh, <laughs> so that's good well thank you so much this was great and i figured this tonight thinking of this could be weeks you know when we go through all of the different channels that we all either share or have individually so yeah absolutely yeah. I mean, there's only 36 channels right so but we made it through a pretty good number we made it through like five today but yeah, yeah. and i you know i'm happy to keep going next week with channels by type just because i'm particularly yeah. interested in like the projected channels and but also the generated channels and how that you know to, to kind of add the, the element to the channel of of type so when we're looking at generator channels what does it mean for this channel to only operate in response and how does the sacred right. response tie into it or when we're looking at manifested channels like what Ra was saying how that 3635 can just pop up out of nowhere and can just immediately you know it's so easy to find experience because it's just waiting to just jump in at any point experience is everywhere but right. the projected channels need energy and the projected channels are all kind of starved for energy so they're dormant much more often and they, they need to hook into something energized. And um, so I think, yeah, let's just continue with channels by type next week and then uh, see where we get if we want to keep going with channels. Um, otherwise, there's plenty of other interesting topics. Um, just as a side note, a couple of the things that I've done recently, I gave a Penta reading for a family. And so I've learned much more about Penta analysis. I had, I had done a couple in the past, but I hadn't really... This was a paid one, and so the paid ones I always try to put a lot of you know extra effort into just really to give them lots of good good stuff, and um, so because of that I do I do have like knowledge that's new to me about Penta and how to do Penta reading that I didn't really have before, so that would be cool um, to do Penta reading yeah. at some point in the future, and then the other thing I've been doing is I've been reading. Um, the advanced uh basically all about fractal lines and base and very like kind of the mystical side of it it's um it's it's just more of the mysticism and that can always be fun i mean not a lot practical out of that yet but i am curious about it and i'm learning about it and i am kind of starting to gain a newfound appreciation for I always kind of just wrote off base to something that doesn't really matter or is not really that significant. And I still feel like it doesn't really have much personal connection, but just in terms of kind of the sense of wonder about how our world is and also where we get tone, color, and line from. Because tone, color, and line are all um, rooted in base, and there's only five bases. And so the sixth color and sixth tone and sixth line is always kind of the special case precisely because there is no sixth base. And so even just doing like one week on that, on just looking at how how this pattern emerged out of Ra's work. And like, I didn't realize how early it was in his work. He actually, um, in the book I'm reading of his, which is a transcription of his lectures, has illustrations that he did in 1988, like very, very early, like from the, almost the beginning, yeah. where he did the base illustrations and the crystals of consciousness and so on. So I would say, um, just for a kind of a loose schedule, let's continue with Channels by Type next week. I'll go ahead and make the invite. Then after that, if there's enough interest, we can do Penta. And then mm -hmm. 
um, we could possibly do a little bit on fractal lines, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so that'd be kind yeah, of that'd be great. That's good, Jonah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy. A great time. So thanks all for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Barbara, Bye. I'll talk Bye. to you. Sleep yes, we'll right. talk. Uh, call me tomorrow. Oh, okay. okay. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye, Mike. Good night. Sweet dreams. <laughs>